Hi guys, it's me again. So today was day three of the uh, Ghislaine Maxwell trial and it was a complete win for the prosecution. I'm very happy to report that. Um, I think we need some good news and that's definitely good news um, for us that want to see justice. Um, the prosecution, I want to just make a couple of things clear because I did get a lot of questions on social media as to whether or not I believe that this trial was rigged. A lot of people are saying it's a show trial and it's a horse and pony show and whatever. I cannot speak to that. I don't know if it's rigged. I don't have any way of knowing that. However, I can tell you what I have seen and how I feel about what's taking place in the courtroom. And what I feel is taking place in the courtroom is that Comey and her team are there to win. There's no doubt in my mind or in anybody else's mind that was there with me today or yesterday or the day before, even from opening statements, it was pretty clear that the very stark difference between how the defense is taking this trial and where they're taking it to and how what their strategy is versus the prosecution. Obviously on the first day, everyone's nervous and whatever else, and that was that. But today's day three, and now I think everyone's become very comfortable with like the ebb, the flow of the trial, how it's going and whatnot. And I, in my heart of hearts, if I had to make a prediction right now, it could change tomorrow because everything could change tomorrow. But if I had to make a prediction right at this moment, if someone asked me what's going to happen if Ghislaine takes that stand, if Ghislaine takes that stand, Kwame is going to shred her. She is going to shred her. She's going to tear her apart. She, that is the, the way that the prosecution is moving forward with their um, recrosses, how they're moving forward. They're very professional. I know I said in video one that they're very young, and they are, but they are full of fire they are full of like they want to win this that's what i'm the impression that i'm getting as of today day three in this trial the defense the way that they're going about their defense is ridiculous their strategy is all over the place let me so these are notes that i typed up so that i can kind of try to get everything together for you guys in a more linear fashion but these are my actual notes so I will be reading from my notes, so please be patient, but I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple of things for you guys right off the bat. So, like I said, the prosecution is doing a phenomenal job. The lead prosecution uh, prosecutors are Maureen Comey, Allison Gainfort Moe, Lara, Lara Elizabeth Pomerantz, Alex Ross Miller, and Andrew Rohrbach. Okay, of all of these, the only one I have not seen in action is Ross Miller. Today we had Mo and we had Warback, and they both did phenomenally. Um, on the defense side, today was a woman uh, by the name of Menninger, and then at the end it was uh, Sternheim. I had already seen her. Uh, she's the one that gave the opening statement. So Menninger was a complete mess, like utter mess. I don't know. The, that's another thing. The judge is doing a great job. The judge is like a saint. The patience that it takes to sit there and listen to some of this stuff and not just react, right? Manager did a horrific job today in cross-examination. She wasted everybody's time. It was five hours of cross-examination, which produced nothing, nothing except just wasting time. I don't know if that was, if that was the tactic, if that was the end game, then she actually did that. But if her, um, you know, goal was to actually get something meaningful for the defense, she failed. But she did get everybody super annoyed, including the judge. So it was a very long day. And so today it started off with the cross-examination, Menninger's cross-examination of the one of the accusers who's going by the name of Jane. It's an alias uh, to protect her real identity. And she, that's the name. And then later on in the day, we had um, one of her ex-boyfriends, he was going by the name of Matt, also to protect to protect her identity. And the last witness that came up was a gentleman um, who worked for the camp, the summer camp, where Ghislaine Maxwell and uh, Jeffrey Epstein met um, Jane and where all that started, right? And so this is... Uh, this. In the beginning, like I said, it was all cross-examination. So at the very tail end of the day is when we got 
um, Matt and the gentleman, which I wrote down in my notes, I forgot his name right now, who worked for the camp. And so that was at the very, very end. So the bulk of this day was on this cross-examination of Jane. Now, the judge sustained the, pros the 16 of the prosecution's objections. I think there were like 20 in total and only four of them were overruled but the rest were sustained and to the point that the judge actually told Menninger, you've asked her that question numerous times. She's answered no every time. Let's move on. Like, yes, please. And it was just horrible. Okay. Another thing that Menninger did, she referred to documents that had not been introduced into evidence. Who does that, right? I think they let them in because they had gotten them late or that was the excuse that they used. They ended up being FBI documents that um, reported or recorded uh, somehow. There was no transcript. It wasn't a transcript. Let me be clear. It was not a transcript. It was a an interview that Jane had given the FBI when all this stuff happened with Epstein in 2019. Somehow or other, they found out about her and you know, she gave them an interview, she gave them various interviews, but the defense took one of those interviews on one of those days and used that to try to trip her up with what she had said yesterday. Um, let's see. So basically the defense was trying to break down everything that the witness, that the accuser, that Jane was saying yesterday by using a, a, not even a transcript by using a document written by the FBI, by an FBI agent two years ago. And so they were comparing that. And for example, uh, some of the questions that were introduced or she was trying to like put a shadow of, of doubt over is like who asked for her mother's number? Was it Galena? Was it Epstein? Who said that they offered scholarships? Was it Galena? Was it Epstein? Who, whether or not Galena or Epstein was home when Jane and her mother went to Epstein's home to meet him for the first time for tea. Was Ghislaine there or was she not? Anyways, none of this is relevant, is my point. Because whether Ghislaine was there or not does not mean that she did or did not do the things she's accused of. Point blank. Whether or not it was Ghislaine who asked or Jeffrey who asked, doesn't matter. Again, irrelevant. But they let it slide. This was her whole thing. So let's get into the notes. Um, I hope you guys are patient because I don't want to miss anything. I don't want something important to go by and for me not to tell you guys because I don't want, I don't know what's going to happen in the future and I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So mm -hmm, let's see. So I'm going to today, Nadia. I hope you guys had a great day, by the way. Okay, day three. Here we go. So it's a manager, right? So she says, you didn't mention Ghislaine uh, Maxwell when you spoke to reporters about the first day you met Epstein, correct? You told the government only Epstein, and that was like, a lot of this was like, object, like there was an objection to whatever. You told the government only Epstein came to meet you. Objection. Um, in September 19th, 2019, you said Ghislaine walked by with her dog and Epstein went up to you and she said correct and Epstein said can I have your mom's number and she said um, not Ghislaine and she said no <clears throat> not Ghislaine she said someone called your mom not Ghislaine and she said I don't know you didn't cross any state lines did you she said no when you met for tea only uh, Jeffrey was there not Ghislaine she said I don't recall Ghislaine being in the house regardless doesn't matter um, so the pros the prosecution objected various times. I'm not, I'm not going to mention that every time because I don't want to bore you guys. Okay. So, so Epstein said he gave scholarships, correct? She said, yes, he didn't, he didn't, um, mention Ghislaine, correct? Correct. Yesterday you testified for the first few months. You were there by yourself. You were by yourself. Correct. I was and she said, so the defense is like, well, you said you were there by yourself and now you're saying Ghislaine was there, which is it? So Jane clarified, she said, I was there without my mother. A lot of this, a lot of the questioning is like this. It's really amateur mistakes um, and just stuff that it's like ridiculous. Okay, in the beginning, 
uh, I would be with my mother's and brother's in Epstein's house, correct? You said that, correct? She said, I don't recall. Okay, you said there was a sweet Latin American man who acted as a chauffeur and he would pick you up every, every week for three years, correct? So he can corroborate with you, yes. So you told the government, in 2019, you told the government you were not sure if Ghislaine ever called you to make appointments, correct? She said, I don't know, I don't recall. When in Florida, Epstein or his office would call your house, correct? She said, I don't know, I don't remember. And then she said, memory is not linear, which we all know that that's absolutely true. You can remember something today that you had forgotten up until today. It doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, she said, Epstein came to dinner at Bear Ridge. I think it was called Bear Ridge. Your mother and brothers were present, correct? She said, correct. In uh, February 2020, you told the government that they visited you one to two times in your house in Florida, correct? She said, correct, I guess. I'm trying to be accurate. So the dinner at your house was prior to any abuse. And Jane said, that's not true. There were objections, the documents, all the thing, whatever. You said Epstein came to your house prior to the abuse, correct? Correct. You said Ghislaine was like an older sister to you, correct? Correct. But you have two older sisters, correct? Correct. So what? You have two older sisters, but you have two older sisters? Like you can't have sisterly feelings for anybody? I, that I didn't understand, neither did, any, neither did anybody else with me. You went to visit your sisters when you were still in high school, correct? She said once in high school. Your sisters took you to the movies. They took you shopping, correct? Um, they talked about your boyfriends. And she said, no, I didn't have any boyfriends. Ghislaine and Epstein took you to the movies as well, correct? And it was a nice area, right? What? Whatever. She said, right. Because what else is she going to say? Um, so... She, the defense says Epstein directed who sat where and he never sat next to you, correct? So Ghislaine at this moment was rubbing her arms as if she was really cold, right? And Jane sat with her chin up. Uh, the judge asked them all to just approach the bench because um, manager was doing what she was doing and she had she did this many times today. And so they started to fidget after a long time. Um, but basically, Ghislaine was like, it looked like she was really cold. And Jane just had her countenance just up. She had her face was open toward the, the courtroom. And she seemed very, um, very, like, she was convicted in, in what she was saying. So um, defense comes back. She said, I believe we were talking about the movies. Um, is it true that you told the government that you did not sit next to Epps, uh, um, Epstein? She said, I don't know. Um, refer to such document. Does it refresh your memory? Yes. Nothing sexual ever happened in the movie theater, correct? Correct. But Jane never said that anything sexual had happened in the movie theater. So I didn't understand that question. And it just was irrelevant, like a lot of what manager said. The first time you saw Ghislaine Maxwell without her clothes on, do you recall when that was? I don't recall. Um, I do recall, okay, so then she said, but yesterday you said it was during uh, when you, they were at the pool and it was Ghislaine Maxwell and four other women and they, some were topless and some were naked and she said, um, but the question wasn't whether you know, she was topless or naked. Nobody asked me. And then the defense said, well, you didn't ask for clarification. Another objection, obviously. Uh, when you spoke with the government in December 2019, you said that you don't have a specific memory of Ghislaine, the first time having sex with Ghislaine. Objection. Uh, finally, she said, I don't recall. Because the question is like, when you spoke with the government, you, don't, you said that you didn't have a recollection of have the first time having sex with Ghislaine, correct? Now, is the question, do you recall saying that to the government? Or is the question, do you recall having the first time having intercourse with, like that, all her questions were this way. They were very like sneaky and shysty and just very like, like trying to trip her up no matter what. And that questions where any type of answer could be taken like 10 different ways. But thank God Jane kept her like her, composure and she was able to see through that and she kept it real right so um there was a period of time that it was only you and epstein 
um, another objection. In 2019, you told the government that you have no specific memory of your first time with Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, she said, I don't recall. You came up with that memory? She said, I don't think I came up with a memory. You told the government that the first time you had sex with Ghislaine, there were two other girls there, correct? She said, correct. Now she's reading the document to see what she what was written. She said, correct, but the wording that was typed up here is incorrect. So the defense said, a typo, and she said, correct. So they asked you if there were times when it was just you and Ghislaine, correct? She said, I don't recall. You don't recall Ghislaine ever touching you? She said, that's not true. This is what I'm, do you see where I'm going with this? Like, you answer the question and it, then she uses it and applies it to another, something completely different. Uh, in 2019, you told the government that you don't recall Ghislaine Maxwell ever touching you, kissing you, or how to massage or how to give hand jobs. I'm sorry. Uh, she said, I don't recall. You told the government that you have no memory of Ghislaine being present when Epstein had sex with you. She said, I don't recall. Uh, manager now said, excuse me, if she wants to speak to the counselors, she goes back to her table and she starts talking with her team. I don't know about what. She comes back. She said, you said you don't recall if you told the government that you, Epstein, and Ghislaine were ever alone in a room, correct? She said, I don't recall. She keeps repeating, I don't recall. I, I, I'm not 100% because I have to look it up, but what I don't recall actually means in legal terms, it's, I don't think it means that she can't remember it. Maybe it's just a way, I'll, I guess I'll get back to you or maybe you guys can tell me in the comments what it actually means, but I understood that, that that's what it meant. I don't recall, it's just a way to like keep it moving. Um, it's a relevant type of deal or um, we already went through this or your question doesn't make any sense. Okay, as you sit here today, you don't, you don't remember if you were ever alone with Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. She said no. And um, okay, so here's the thing. So Jane's lawyer, keep in mind that uh, Jane had already two civil lawsuits. Like, she had two civil lawsuits going on at the time that the Epstein Fund reached out to her and said, you know, that they had this money that she could be awarded, right? So the two, she had one against Epstein, one against Ghislaine at that very moment. In order to get the money from the Epstein Fund, she had to drop her litigation against Epstein and against Ghislaine, and she did. She received $5 million, which she kept $2.9 million, and the rest went to her lawyer. But her lawyer, Mr. Glassman, was convinced that she should have gotten 25 million because of her age and because of the timeline. It was three full years and that was a lot and there was a lot of abuse. So he he didn't get what he thought she deserved from the fund. And so then the defense was trying to make that seem as if that that's the reason why um, Jane was in the courtroom today, because she was doing it out of revenge, because she felt cheated or somehow that she didn't get what she deserved or, or that, you know, she just wanted to, like, get back at them, whatever, right? Okay, but, but I want to clarify something right now, but she gets no money from anything that happens in this trial because it's done. The monetary compensation that she could have had or would have had or whatever had, it already she already got it. So there is none. Why would a person who is, she's a working actor. Okay, I will tell you, I know who she is. That's all I'm gonna say. I would never you know, disclose who she is because I think she's been through a lot and she's gone through great pains to keep her identity um, private and I respect that and I respect her. A person like herself in the public eye, she is a working actor. She has been for many years. Why would she put herself in a situation where she's in a courtroom, anybody could recognize her. Any one of us could recognize her. The jury could recognize her. And it, people being people, it could slip, it could come out. Why would she go there, risk that, just to get revenge? Like, what would be the point of that? I didn't see any connection. I thought that was pretty flimsy and I think manager could have done a better job had she just stuck to I don't know maybe talking uh, like connecting it more to Maxwell which she barely did basically she was most of her argument was around was um circling Epstein 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 so I don't know 
I'll talk to you about that later, but anyways, getting back to this. So she now she started a pattern of questions trying to say like that that was the reason and that caused um the judge to call the council call them all because you know she can't the way that she was making the questions the way she was framing the questions it was completely unprofessional to be nice so the judge very patiently said okay you know sidebar whatever they were like 15 minutes it was a while uh, she let go of the jury, the jury returned, and then at 11.28, when they came back, I don't know what the judge said or did or what happened, but manager came back completely different. She was completely docile. She was not the same aggressive um, cross-examiner that she was in the beginning of the day. She was very docile. She, what, her tone even changed. You know, she was very much like this, like this, as opposed to how she had just been which I said to a woman sitting next to me, I said, she must have gotten spanked pretty hard if this is the change that we see in her. And she was like, I agree. Like, absolutely, you could tell. So Menninger starts, okay, so the pool house in Florida, that was the first time that you had an intercourse with, um, or sexual, um, whatever, relations with Jeffrey Epstein, correct? She said, correct. December 2019, um, you told the government the first time you were abused was in New York. And Jane said, that is not correct. But you said it was on a trip to New York that you went on to take headshots. She said, I don't recall. Because again, do you re is it, did you take the trip to get headshots? It's, these type of questions are very like misleading. And I'm just glad that Jane kept her composure and she was able to see that and see through that and just keep it together. So, Finally, she said, she's reading the document, right? Jane, she says, with all due respect, I didn't write this. I'll read this, and this is incorrect. So this was the first time that she had seen this document because, again, it was not presented in evidence. So uh, in February 2020, you said it was your first trip to New York was uh, just to, to go for fun, just for fun, you told the government. She said, I don't recall. Then again, she reiterates, with all due respect, I didn't write this. I was, it was, I was not recorded. This is just someone jotting down their notes, and this is incorrect. That's a direct quote. So there were four more objections that were all sustained. Uh, Menninger, her phrasing was really annoying and immature and unprofessional. She made a ton of amateur mistakes, and nearly all the objections were um, sustained. So, okay. So then she says, well... 90%, you said that 90% of the time you traveled with Ghislaine Maxwell and um, Epstein involved sex, correct? She said, correct. But now you went from 90% to nothing happened, correct? So there was an objection. Obviously, 90 is not 100, right? So if you take 100 trips and in 10 of those trips, XYZ does not happen, and you're talking about one trip, one is in 10, so that, that still holds. I don't know if manager is hoping that the jury doesn't know math, or I don't know if she's trying to like just bludgeon them to death with boring like fluff. I don't know what, I can't see who signed off on this. I don't see why anybody would think that this type of cross-examination was a good idea. But there you have it. So Jane responds, my timeline was wrong at the time that she said that to the FBI, okay. Uh, you said that you took a trip to New York to see the Lion King. Wouldn't that have been exciting? If she said, correct. She said, wouldn't that have been exciting for a young person to go see the Lion King on a trip on the jet? Correct, that would have been exciting. That was stupid. And Jane said, I guess so. And then a juror was having trouble. I think uh, like they had, they had a coughing fit or something. The judge released them and then they came back. And then you told the government that you flew to New York uh, to see The Lion King on Broadway. And then Jane said, this is incorrect. This is a direct quote. This is not a transcript. And a lot of these are incorrect. Another objection, a couple of them. You recall seeing the play, not the movie, correct? Although you had told the government two times previously that you had flown to New York to see the Lion King show, but were then told that the play was not produced until much later. 
so she said, correct, but that wasn't the only time um, we had flown. In other words, like what she said prior, I got the timeline wrong. So it wasn't the only trip that they had taken to New York. So if she had it confused of when she went to see the play or not, it's irrelevant. One of the times she did go, and that goes to memory, right? But again, memory is not linear. And if you are now under a different situation, in my opinion, that you are being like directly, like, and plus, keep in mind, this is very important, the, the documents that were presented today by the defense were just one interview. There were many interviews. We don't know that later on in another interview, Jane didn't correct herself. There's no way for us to know that. Do you see? She could have said in a different interview, oh, you know, I got this wrong, let me correct myself, blah, blah, blah. But we will never know because the defense only took that one interview out of the many to present it, to um, compare it with what Jane said yesterday. So this is a type of like really slimy, you know, like if you don't have a case, which obviously makes me feel like they have no defense because if this is what you need to do to actually score a win or to get the jury confused, that's pretty sad. Like you should have more than that at this point, in my opinion. So um, in February 2020, you told the government that there was no abuse in New Mexico, correct? She said, no, that's not correct. This is not a transcript and that is not correct. That's a direct quote. So she said that she'd never read it again, that it wasn't a transcript and that much of it was incorrect. She just kept saying this over and over. Um, you never saw any other underage girls with Epstein, none in the orgies uh, were underage, correct? And she said, I wouldn't know that, which is common sense. So she said, Epstein introduced you to Trump and took you to Mar-a-Lago in a green car, correct? She said, correct. Said that was before the pool house incident, correct? She said, I don't remember that. Um, and then she starts bringing up, so now the defense is bringing up four other women that uh, Jane had told the FBI about that could have corroborated with what her statements. A woman named Sophie, a woman named Ava, a woman named Emmy, and a woman named Michelle. Oh, and another woman named Kelly. So these were all names that um, Jane had given the FBI when she was um, interviewed in 2019. And the defense is asking her, so all of these women could corroborate with what you've said, right? And she says, correct. And then she said, between 2019, I do not, maybe you guys can explain this to me. She said, between 2019 and today, have you ever been shown any picture of these women? What difference does that make? And she said, no. This is the, the wasting of our time that we had to go through like all for five hours, okay. Um, so now the defense is starting to drop more names, right? She says, Prince Andrew, um, you were on a flight with Prince Andrew, correct? She said, correct. She said, uh, do you recall that Leslie, an assistant, would make travel arrangements for you? Uh, correct, she said, correct. And she said, um, Emmy or Michelle could have also made these arrangements for you, correct? And she said, this timeline here is not correct. And I did not know Emmy or Michelle in Florida. So that's a hard no. Epstein staff in um, Epstein's New York home can corroborate your statements, correct? Again, all the questioning was about Epstein, 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 all the time. Um, so I... And this is something we spoke about in the room. I can't tell if she's trying to deflect attention from Ghislaine or if she is trying to meld them together. Meld uh, Ghislaine and to Jeffrey Epstein and then kind of go through the back way and prove him innocent and by association that would make her innocent. Because if that is the tactic, that is really stupid. I don't, I don't think that there's anybody sitting in that jury that doesn't know full well that Jeffrey Epstein, who he, who he was, and that he also already had a past. He was already, um, whatever, arrested or whatever, tr not tried, sorry, that he got a sweetheart deal for pedophilia, for having sex with a minor back in 2005. So people already are aware of this. We've been aware of this. So... Tying Maxwell to Epstein 
as a way and then trying to save him to save her that seems like I don't know in what world that would work. I don't understand how these seasoned lawyers, because again, remember the prosecution is very young. And at first when I saw them, I was like, oh, you know, they're so young, like what's gonna happen here? But no, I thought that the seasoned professionals would be better, but they are not. I don't know what ta what their tactic is. Maybe you guys can explain it. Maybe you guys have thoughts. I would love to hear them because at this point I, I do not understand. Like the way they're going about this is completely not the right way. Uh, it's just making everybody super irate, and if I'm irate, I can imagine the jury is even more irate. Um, so then she asks her, did you rehearse your direct testimony? So she says, no, I did not. She said, do you continue to... F uh, okay, so she said, you continued traveling on Mr. Epstein's dime, this is a direct quote, after escaping him, correct? First of all, isn't there a better choice of words? Dime? Like, you're a professional. You don't have professional words. And escape him? She wasn't sequestered. She wasn't kidnapped. She never said that she was. She never said that she escaped him. So literally putting things, words in Jane's mouth. And also being snarky and super unprofessional. So she, she I don't know, even, I think there might have been an objection there because I don't have an answer. And then she changed the question she said but you continued to fly on his private jet after 2019 or i'm sorry uh after she had moved to in 2009 or that she had left she had moved to la and she said only once and um so the defense says you wanted to stop the press okay so now the defense is trying to prove with this line of questioning she's trying to establish that um, Jane got representation because she wanted money. That that was the only reason why Jane ever came forward with anything because she realized that there were funds and that she could be compensated. And so that's why she got a lawyer and that's why she did all this, blah, blah, blah. Right? Uh, her lawyer's name is Mr. Glassman. So this is the line of question. You wanted to stop the press. Um, so you heard, so you hired an attorney in 2015? She said yes and you paid her a million dollars. And Jane said, no. And then the defense says, but you retained her for $250,000. And Jane said, no. And the defense said, why? We all burst out laughing right there. Like, why what? Why didn't I retain someone for $250,000? Like, isn't, it's just, oh my God, I'm not a lawyer. But even I could have framed a better question than that. So she just said, why? And then Jane was kind of like, she's like, it was $25,000. Maybe that's a typo. She said, I don't have any money to pay anyone $250,000 for anything. So I got a lawyer to stop people from harassing me and bullying me into giving statements. And we'll find out why. And... Okay, then the defense says, well, you could have asked your lawyer to reach out to the government and report this um, crime you say happened. You said you were just not interested. So you're saying you're just not interested in getting involved. She said, that's right. Objection sustained. When did you hire Mr. Glassman? And they took a break because, I don't know, something happened there. I'm sorry I didn't write it down, but it was like so long in the day i think it was lunchtime already it had gone on so long and the the questioning the, the judge was like you know are you are you starting a new like line or what what's happening so they decided to break for lunch to give people a break thank god so basically okay when we came back before the jury got brought in there was a question as to whether or not there was a claim by the defense that Mr. Glassman had spoken to the government and had told the government about his expectation of her outcome uh, if she gave testimony for further litigation. Now, this goes to attorney-client privilege, which is why they were discussing this not in front of the jury. So the prosecution rightly said, this is attorney-client uh, privilege, and the defense said, not if he told it to the government. And then the judge said, well, in that case, you would have to bring him here or else it is hearsay and you have to bring him here. She's like, well, um, the judge said, we have to make some type of a uh, plan. You're gonna ask her 
and it's funny because I can't even, it, it was so convoluted, I couldn't write it down. The question had to be phrased in such a way that the judge was trying to phrase it and even the judge herself could not phrase it. It ended up being like 30 words, I kid you not. It was something super long. I was trying to write it down, I couldn't get it all down. And she said that would be the only way that you could ask her. If she says yes, or if she says no, there has to be a plan. So if she says yes, that's the end of it, the judge said. That's the end of it and you gotta bring Mr. Glassman in here. If she says no, that's also the end of it. So basically the judge was putting the parameters down, thank God, right? So, um, so she did, so the judge did protect Jane's privilege to privacy. Um, Menninger created such a, like I put it here, convoluted word salad that even the judge had difficulty expressing the defense's position. If yes, it was the end of the subject. If no, then the defense would have to bring in Mr. Glassman for questioning. That's as far, regardless, it would be the end for Jane, regardless. So, um, so the prosecution, so the defense finally rested, thank God, and the prosecution said, re, recross, right? This, it was Mo. Mo is so, I can't tell you how professional and just like really to the point and also just very, but not in a bad aggressive way, like just like a person who has it handled and she's just gonna get to the point and moving on and it doesn't take her a long time to do that. So she said, um, the litigation is over and resolved the witness has no financial stake in testifying um, she has no pending civil civil case uh, the judge then had to clarify that uh, to Menninger who apparently couldn't understand that the judge told Menninger that that being considered she couldn't free she couldn't phrase it as if there were any benefit or that any benefit it could have had been had not that it can be had they finally agreed to that um, Okay, so, though the prosecution also mentioned the length of the cross-examination as prosecution's next witness, Matt, who was the boyfriend that Jane said that she had spoken to and told everything to, the only person she had ever told everything to, was at the court and ready to testify. Uh, Menninger presented a different question that asked nothing but made a new statement. You knew that testifying would help you in your litigation, correct? Well, the judge said there's no question there, so then she said, correct. So I guess, yeah, correct. So witnesses came back at 2.15, and at this point, Ghislaine is having a very animated discussion with the male attorney, I forget his name, you guys probably know, um, and there were a lot of hand gestures. There was like a lot of this going on, like a lot. And usually when they spoke, it was just like, you know, kind of like talking to each other like this or passing notes like on day one, but this was a full-on like conversation that was emotional, it looked like to me. So... The defense says uh, a trip was paid for you on April 2000 for $343. Uh, does this, as she said, I don't recall. She gave him the document, said, read this. Does this refresh your recollection? She said, no, it does not. Um, you knew your testimony would help you with your litigation. She said, no, I don't know that. You testified that you could not tell your mother about what happened with Epstein, that your mother was absent and couldn't... Uh, and wouldn't want you to say personal things, that's right. Uh, you recall that you and your mother, you recall you and your mother filing a lawsuit against a teacher at the professional school for pulling your hair? And Jane said, I didn't know that. I had no idea my mother did that. So she referred her to the document. The prosecution was trying, okay, so I said here, the prosecution is trying Ghislaine Maxwell and the defense is trying Epstein. Every time the defense uh, makes an argument, it's about Epstein, not Ghislaine. And this is like a lot of lost time. So that's when the judge said she's answered the same question the same way, so let's go. That was a direct quote. She, she's answered the same way, so let's go. You want to ask her... Okay, so the judge says you want to ask her if she recognizes the name. Uh, do you know that you like the name of the of the teacher that supposedly um her mother had made a lawsuit for and this is why this is why so do you know that you and your mother um uh, sued the principal of that school jane said no and <laughs> this is a direct quote she said no and we're friends on facebook so everybody started laughing it was really ridiculous so 
uh, manager says, you consider yourself an actor? This, this line of questioning really got under my skin because I'm an actor. And just because you're an actor or have acted or no actors or whatever, your director, your producer, whatever, doesn't mean that you have lost touch with reality or that you are not a real person or that you don't know the difference between real life and um, memorizing lines. Those are two completely different things. You don't stop being a human being because you're an actor. You may be better at acting and you may be able to convince some people of some things, but at the end of the day, it doesn't. you'd have to be a true psychopath to do this all the time, right? And you can be an actor and not be a psychopath. And this line of questioning was so like bottom of the barrel. Like this is where you're gonna go. The minute she started with this line of questioning, everybody in the in the room that I was in on the ninth floor, everybody was like, oh my god, like really, like this is this is what we're gonna do now. So she said, you you consider yourself an actor, correct? Yes. Um. You told the government that you were 13 when you met Epstein. She said, no, I said I was probably 13, but I turned 14 that summer. Um, you said you met Mike Wallace at his 80th birthday party. Jane said, yes, I sang at his birthday party. Objection, whatever. Okay, you said you moved to New York in 1996. She said, no, I wouldn't have said that because I didn't. I moved in 1998. And Ghislaine at that time came like rubbing her arms as if she was cold again. So finally, um, we get to the reader. I don't know if I wrote it down, but if I didn't, I want to tell you guys exactly what happened. Because she, okay, yeah, I didn't write it down. So what, what um, manager was doing when she asked a question about acting, she started listing all of Jane's accomplishments, all of her theater work, all of her TV work, all of her everything work, uh, all the awards she had won, all the international um, competitions she had entered and won. And, you know, she's saying, yes, correct, yes, correct, and all this, you know. And, and you know, she didn't land it, like the question directly, like, are you acting now? But I guess she was trying to plant that seed, I guess. But it was really weak. It was just stupid. We live in New York. The, the city's full of, of people in the arts. It doesn't mean that they're not real people. It just, it was, it didn't make any sense. All right, so finally at 2.55, the prosecution, Mo, said uh, she was going to uh, recross. Thank God right? She was so good at this. She was like a superstar. I kid you not. I almost like I would have, if I was in that exact trial room, I would have gotten up and clapped. Like she did such a great job. Um, so first question, she said, did I or any of us tell you what to say at this trial? She said, no. What did we tell you to say? Jane said the truth. When you met with, um, the FBI, every detail of every, was every detail of every topic at every meeting discussed or were there different topics at different meetings discussed? And Jane said different times, different times at different meetings, different topics. Did you take notes? Jane said no. Was it difficult to take, to talk to government at first, at the first meetings? Jane said yes. She said, uh, why? And Jane said, I was telling my most painful, shameful experiences to strangers. She said, over time, were you more comfortable? Jane said, yes, I got more familiar. It didn't feel quite as embarrassing. That's a direct quote. Um, I want to say also that, like, through a lot of, of what was speaking about, I didn't write it down, but um, Jane was doing the same thing she did the other day, which is she's her voice was very calm if you were only listening to the audio you wouldn't know that this woman was crying but we knew she was crying because she kept doing this like she was doing this and this so she was crying but her voice was very um clear and very like just convicted she she wasn't wavering at all right i want to make that point because of what i'm gonna what's gonna happen now so um why uh, there were fewer people at the meetings with the government that made you feel more comfortable yes uh why do you think she said um that she was more more comfortable why do you think we had less people at the meeting she said so that i could be more comfortable i guess and the defense objected to that not sure why it was overruled obviously uh did epstein help your family financially jane said yes he gave us cash because the first question was did your family's financial um 
like whatever your family's finances uh, get better or change when after you met Epstein she said no in other words they were still broke but then the next question was did Epstein help your family financially she said yes cash computer he paid for some school stuff uh, interlocking for two summers and he gave us gifts and when you moved interlocking is the summer camp where they all met uh, when you moved out of the pool house where did you move to and did Epstein pay for that so this was a great question because it was my understanding and I had read on the internet this is why you guys cannot trust we can't we can't we just cannot trust even the fact that I went to this trial after Twitter had put out like oh they're, they're not gonna let anybody in and that was not true there's so many things on the internet that are just not true that we can't even take we have to take everything with a grain of salt even when someone's agreeing with us or maybe especially when they're agreeing with us if, if someone says something to you and you guys are always agreeing that's not the truth if the person that you're talking to you never have like a moment where you're like mm, I don't agree with that they're not being frank and that's a problem and that's not a person that you want around you because they're manipulating you right they're telling you what you want to hear and what I had read was that Epstein had paid for the home that um, Jane and her mother and her two brothers lived in while she knew him and this and that apparently that was false that was not true so the prosecutor asked her when you moved out of the pool house where did you move did Ep Epstein pay for that and she said it was a three-bedroom house my sister rented it for us see and then um, prosecution says why did you speak with a tabloid reporter direct quote she said because he blackmailed me he said Epstein's little black book came out and my name was in it he promised to keep my name anonymous if I gave him a statement so this is not a direct quote so she offered him a a, a brief statement about how she met Epstein um, and it was a phone conversation that was it she was in her car she called him and she just said that and he left her alone um, she didn't want any I she said I don't want anyone to associate me with to, I didn't want anyone to associate me with what was happening with Epstein um, prosecution said how'd you meet your lawyer she said referral a good friend of my husband um, his best friend I and I liked him and I mean just the redirect was excellent she asked her a couple of questions about her height and weight when she was in, in um, in interlocking to make the point of like when the pilot said that he had met Jane and she was a very mature woman in actuality uh, when she was 14 was she her first interlocking application she was 5'2 and weighed 90 pounds and she was in seventh grade so she was not mature at all um, and it went on from there okay so do you know the difference between acting on television and testifying in court she said yes she said why are you here she said I'm here to hopefully find some closure help in help in any way and find some peace and healing why is that memory pretty strong this is what the prosecution asked her about when she met Epstein and, and Ghislaine why why is that memory pretty strong she said because it was the beginning of when my life would change forever that's a direct quote how old were you when you when you touched Epstein's privates she said 14 uh, what would you do I would uh, masturbate him who instructed you the first time was Ghislaine that's a direct quote why do you remember that quote because that's when the fun casual relationship I had with Ghislaine changed and then the prosecution Mo said would you give back the money awarded to you by the fund if it meant that you wouldn't have been abused and she broke down like right there it was like instant it wasn't like little by little it was like an immediate breaking down she didn't make a lot of noise but she just covered her face and she shook and the prosecutor was like take your time whatever and then I mean it was it was heartbreaking to watch like she was had been strong all the time you know and like I said she was crying and she still had her countenance she still had her like very her her energy was like you're what I could feel was like her energy was like you're not gonna shut me up 
you're not going to shut me up. You're not going to stop me. I don't care what you say to me. I don't care how many questions you ask me. I'm going to be here for it and I'm going to get this out. And I could feel that coming from her. But when she was asked this question, it was like she folded in like within herself. And it was tough to watch. And she regained her composure. She didn't make a big deal about it. And she said, hopefully this puts it all to an end. Um, she said, I wish I, I would have never gotten the money. I wish I would never had a reason to be sitting here or had a reason to get the money. She said, unfortunately, in our society, the only way to get compensated is with money. But, you know, what's that going to do? And then this is a direct quote, hopefully this puts it all to an end and I can move on with my life. So the prosecutor said, do you have any financial gain by testifying in this trial? She said, no. Thank you, Your Honor. That was the end of that. And then the next guy up was Matt. The interesting thing about Matt, and I'm not going to read all of it because it was pretty brief. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase because I think you guys can read the transcripts. Um, the interesting thing about Matt is when he spoke about um, the argument that he had seen, when he said that the first time that, that Jane told him the first time Jane had spoken about Epstein was kind of saying like, oh, because you know, they were getting to know each other. They ended up living together, I think it was like seven years or something. And they were speaking about, she said, well, you know, during the time when her father died, they lost all their money. They were living in a pool house and all this, and that, and the other. And how did you, how did you afford things? And she said, well, I had a godfather and he helped my mom out and he would give me money. And that's how I was able to, you know, get things done like at that time. So in the back of this guy's head, it was always like, okay like that was it and little by little the truth started coming out when Epstein got arrested um, Jane told him but well he kind of saw like the change in her and he's like is that is that your godfather and she said yes and did he do things to you and she said yes and then when Ghislaine got her that's when she told him about Ghislaine because he was like why didn't you call your mother why didn't you tell your mother why didn't you tell anybody like how why would you still be in that position and she was explaining to him how it all started that she had felt so comfortable because there was a woman there that she was like a sister to her and things didn't start off like that it, it happened like that eventually and because this woman was there she felt comfortable and she felt safe and then until she wasn't but then that woman being there it was just very confusing and then I assume she didn't say it, but I assume also like the point of like the financial point of like being in that situation where you have no money um, and you're a kid, you're 14 years old, like what, what do you, what do you really, I mean, how, how smart could you be about this? Or could you really say like, oh, you know, screw this, I'm out. Or like, how dare you? I'm going to go to the cops when you're dirt broke. You're not old enough to work. You're, you know what I mean? Your mom, from what she told us, her mom had like little odd jobs. Um, wasn't making enough money. Her mom had food stamps that she wouldn't use because she was too proud to use. So they ended up, the kids ended up just kind of scrounging around and she said something about like giving to her brothers whenever she could get anything. Um, so when Ghislaine got arrested, he said, was that the woman that you were talking about? She said, yes. So the one time, hi guys, sorry, something happened to my microphone. So going back to what i was saying so matt just attested that the fight was horrific it was very rough it was very brutal um that jane told her mother there was no way that you didn't know she did accuse her mother of knowing which obviously i agree with that there's no way she couldn't have known um she told her mother the money was not free quote how do you think i got the money mom um she accused her of knowing it that's a direct quote from matt and um and so moving on. And so that was the end of that, was it? Yes. And then the last witness was Daniel Besselson. And Daniel Besselson, you guys can read the transcripts. I don't have them, but I know some of you do. Um, he worked for 16 years at the Interlock and Center for the Arts. He was the assistant VP of finance. Uh, he knew about the donor records and, and whatnot. So uh, the prosecution, uh, Warback asked him a couple of really great questions. He got right to the point of um, how are these records kept and everything else. And then he showed in, um, in the evidence were letters, right? So it was letters uh, that Epstein had written that he wanted to build a donor lodge. A donor lodge is basically you give $200,000 and you can build a lodge on the campsite, which doesn't make any sense to me because why would you have adults going into a summer camp situation where there are children, right? Because what adult 
wants to do that what normal adult wants to do that right and so the excuse is well because the donors they want to see where their money is going or whatnot I don't buy it and also when the donors aren't there they're not using it um, families get to rent it or whoever gets to rent it if they want to spend time in there that to me is a hard no first of all what family puts their kid in a summer camp to then go visit them right you put your kid in a camp so that your kid can be away from you, can learn some skills, and also so you can get more work done or whatever. You don't go visit your kid. That, that Do you need a lodge for that? Do you need an entire lodge? You can't just get a hotel somewhere and then drive in. That doesn't make sense to me. But, I mean, will the camp reconsider their position considering what happened? I don't think so because they still have the lodges up. So, I guess money talks is all I can say. I don't know the camp, or like who's running the camp or whatnot. I don't want to like throw shade on anybody, but why would you have strangers around kids? Like, why? Why? Look what happens. You now people with money can just go there and start scouting them out, like I'm sure Epstein did. And then, um, okay, so then he brought up a letter that the school had written to Ghislaine on December 23rd, 1994, and it started Dear Ghislaine. So basically, Jeffrey had left some items in the lodge last time that they were there, and the school was just reaching out to her and to let her know that these items were left, and it, it, they were listed, and um, they said, well, if there are any items that are also missing but are not on this list, please let us know as soon as possible so that we can get them for you and save them for you. We're, we're keeping all his stuff here. Please let us know what to do with it, whatever, right? So, dear Ghislaine, that is not how you talk to somebody you don't know. If, if it was just an assistant that they had never seen, let's say, they would have been like, dear Miss Maxwell, but it wasn't. It was dear Ghislaine, and I believe it was sent to her house because they asked a couple of times, like, uh, do you know the address? Do you see the address? Blah, blah, blah. Um... So that to me spoke, sorry, that to me spoke that, to that, the fact that they knew her well enough to feel comfortable sending her the letter and not him or another assistant or whatever. And when um, Mr. Besselson was giving his, when Mr. Besselson was giving his account, Ghislaine Maxwell stood up immediately, immediately, and she was like this over the table. So she's sitting with her defense team like this and she went like this and somebody came up to meet her but I couldn't see that person because they were off frame they were off the screen but I could see their hands coming in and out once in a while right and Ghislaine was like really it was very animated conversation that they were having as this man was giving his testimony so I don't know what that was about but now you know and she did this twice she sat back down and then she did it again um, they were talking about the application for admissions for Jane, 94, 95, 96, and then the defense came up, Sternheim, and she said, well, with regard to the application, did you provide that to the government who paid for that um, student? And he said, no, she said, because you don't have them. Like, just like that. And I, I was like, all right, calm down. Like, it's just super unprofessional. He said, correct, or the siblings, correct. Um, and that was basically it. So. They, I think that they did a good job. I think the prosecution today did an amazing job. Um, again, I think that if I had to say right now, if Ghislaine took that stand, she'd be really stupid to do that because I feel that Kwame and her team are there to win, and I don't see any weirdness with the judge, with with anybody other than the defense because I don't understand their tactics. I don't understand their strategy at all. But so far, everything seems above board. So. I say that to say this, please guys, remember that if someone's agreeing with you 100% of the time, something's wrong. If someone's only telling you exactly what you want to hear, something's wrong. That person is manipulating you. So sometimes we get information uh, from the internet and it, you know people are telling us what we already kind of feel or believe and so we kind of like, yeah, you know, and I, I, I do this too, like I'm not I'm not immune from this, but I'm telling you, I think more so because of my experience in this courtroom, that I feel like a lot of that is BS and a lot of that should be ignored because it's just more division and it's keeping you from knowing the actual truth. And I wish this was televised so that you all could see this with your own two eyes that you would understand what I'm saying, but I'm very grateful to be there and I'm grateful for your support so that I can be there so that I can at least tell you the honest truth because... I will always do that, right? Whether it's popular or not, whether you guys are going to agree or disagree or whatever, it is what it is. The truth above all, that's all that matters. And I feel that right now we need to be truthful more than we need to agree. So 
I'm super looking forward to tomorrow. Um, I can't wait to see what's, who the next witness is going to be. Uh, what I really can't wait for is for the defense to have their turn because I cannot wait to hear those cross-examinations because I feel like whoever gets up there is going to get shredded. That's how I feel right now. It could change tomorrow because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But right now, the way I feel right now, the way I see things going on right now, they're they're gonna go they're gonna go for the win um and let's hope so so anyways you guys thank you so much for listening to me i'll do better tomorrow i know this is brand new and thank you for hanging tight with me and uh, i love you guys i hope anything that i said um added some value and uh i'll see you tomorrow ciao